deity and demons can't live in the same place. And as he worshiped, Jesus said, be made whole. Demons leave. Addiction leave. Prescription drugs leave. Painkillers leave. Secrets on the internet leave. Get out. He's a worshiper. And nothing is authorized to stop his birth. And then I love what it said. It said, and when the village came, he was sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed. In other words, Jesus had covered the scars because he didn't want him to look like what he had been through. I'm going to read just a few scriptures, probably more than I normally would, but I want you to get the gist of this whole story. And it happened as he went to Jerusalem, verse 11 of Luke 17. It happened as he went into Jerusalem that he passed through the midst of Samaria and Galilee. And as he entered into a certain village, there met him ten men who were lepers who stood afar off. They lifted up their voices and they said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. So when he saw them, he said to them, go show yourselves to the priest. This is never a commandment that Jesus ever gives anywhere else. He healed a lot of people in the Bible. He never told them to do this. He told them to do that for a reason. And so it was, as they went, listen to that, they were cleansed. And one of them who saw that he was healed returned with a loud voice, a mega voice, and he glorified God. He fell down at his feet, giving him thanks, and he was a Samaritan. Notice there were ten of them, nine of them were Jews. One of them was a Samaritan, and he's the only one who comes back and says thanks. And Jesus answered and said, were there not ten cleansed? Why are there just nine? Were there not found any who returned to give glory to God except this foreigner? That's why he called him, because he was a Samaritan. In verse 19, and he said to him, arise, go your way, listen to this, your faith has made you whole is the, is the actual word in the King James, sozo in the Greek, whole, complete, restored, undivided, whole. I want to talk to you about how to be made whole. It's very important that we understand the message of leprosy. In the Old Testament, God likens leprosy more than any other disease or sickness to sin, sin in our lives. I, I, I researched leprosy a little bit. I found out some interesting things, some parallels that you may see in what sin does to a person and what leprosy did to people. Ten lepers, all suffering from the same disease, all facing the same tragic death, all of them watching a part of their body literally die and bury that part of who they used to be on a daily basis because in its worst and final stages, the outer extremities begin to decay and fall off. So you're burying a piece of who you used to be on a daily basis. Entire arms, entire parts of the body, the ears, the nose usually would go first. The eyes, all kinds. It's a horrible, horrible disease. When you were a leper, you were an outcast from the temple, from your family, from public. No hope for tomorrow, no dreams, nothing to look forward to. Scavenging like wild dogs through garbage piles. They can't provide for themselves. They are eaten up with this disease. They live a horrible, horrible life. No invitations ever come to a party. No anniversary celebrations, no birthdays, no children, no human touch. A sequestered life, a life where they are, uh, have no contact with the world, no human contact, zombie-like creatures that inhabit the nighttime. It takes so much. It starts with just a speck in your eyelid, and then it spreads as a speck on the palms. It starts as just a tiny, small thing that nobody notices, but if it's not dealt with, it begins to consume. It's interesting that one of the effects of this disease is it, it's, it first begins to kill the nerve endings. 
So you can't feel anymore. You don't feel. It used to be you felt when you first start doing things, you felt bad about it. But when sin is really taking hold of somebody's life, they lose feelings. They lose natural affections. They lose emotions. They lose everything. You begin to bury, again, a part of who you used to be. Victims feel no pain. They, because they don't even know they're infected. They don't even know that, that because if they get a, a splinter or something, usually they would die from infection because they can't even feel anymore. Ten of these men, imagine this now, some, usually ears are gone, usually nose, nose is laying flat, gums and teeth exposed, the walking dead, zombie-like creatures, mummified-looking skin, horrible, horrible. Ten of them approaching Jesus. Somewhere they heard about Jesus. We're not told what they heard. Maybe they heard that He touched the untouchable because in another place, the Bible said a leper came to Him when He came off of a mountain and falling at His feet began to worship Him. And they heard that Jesus reached out his hand and touched the leper and healed him. Maybe they said to one another, he touches the untouchable. Maybe they said he's no respecter of persons. Maybe they said, you know, uh, he, he, he's the great physician. I heard he's the great physician. We're not told, but they heard something. And these zombie-like men walking on bloody stubs, teeth and lips, exposed, sores oozing and running, skin mummified, scabs and infections. They approach Jesus and they cry out, Son of David, have mercy upon us. Son of David, have mercy upon us. And Jesus heard their cry. I want you to understand something about this story. The first big point I want to make is, there, is there's one kind of worship that Jesus cannot resist, and it's leprosy worship. It's leprosy worship. What is leprosy worship? The Bible said when the man came to Jesus who had leprosy and fell at his feet worshiping Jesus, the question that I had is, what does a leper worship God for? Does he say, thank you, Lord, that my fingers are gone? Thank you, Lord, that my eyes are like cotton and I'm blind? Thank you, Lord, that, that, that my, my feet are messed up and I can't hardly walk? Thank you, Lord, that I've lost everything. What does a leper do when he worships? I tell you what leper worship is. Leper worship is when you worship God, not for what he has done, but for who he is. When you begin, when you begin to worship God for who he is. See, some of you, when, when God checks off all the boxes on your dream list, then you'll become an excited, enthusiastic worshiper. But let me tell you, every now and then, you need to give God leper worship. Leper worship says, this has nothing to do with my dreams, my vision, and my desire. If you don't ever answer those prayers, I'm going to worship you for the rest of my life for who you are. You are good, and your mercy endures forever. Everybody just give God some leper worship. <laughs> Everything's not perfect in my life, but I worship you. I haven't got my breakthrough yet, but I worship you. I haven't seen the answer like I want to see the answer, but I worship you. We're going to take a moment, and I want everybody in the balcony and everybody on the floor to interrupt regularly scheduled program right now and give God leper worship because he is worthy who was slain. Praise him just a moment. Praise him just a moment. I didn't get the deal. I didn't get the movie part. I didn't get the contract yet. But I worship you for who you are. God cannot resist. God cannot resist leper worship. Never. Not healed yet, but I worship you for who you are. God cannot resist that kind of worship. Have mercy. And Jesus said to them, Go show yourself to the priest. This is an issue that a counselor can't fix. Nothing wrong with counseling. We need counseling. But this is an issue a psychiatrist can't fix. There's only one place you can go to get this situation fixed. You need to go to the temple. You need to get in the house of God. 
you need to get under anointed teaching. There's something that you can do when the enemy is letting a little bit of your life be buried, everything that you ever wanted, all of your dreams, a piece and another piece and another piece are just dying and you're having a daily funeral of all your hopes and dreams. There's only one place you can go and get made whole. That's to the temple. And as they went, they were healed. As you keep coming to a great church like this, it doesn't happen the first time, but as they went, as you just keep coming, sometimes you come in and you're jacked up. Sometimes you come in and you're angry. Sometimes you come in and you've had your heart broken and you feel like God has abandoned you. Sometimes you come in and you, you've had the worst week in the world, but you just keep coming and as you go there, God begins to restore and heal your life. And I'm right where I want to be in this little sermon. But there's a difference that takes place. I could see those nine lepers running home because evidently there was probably a, 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 a sore that was oozing. But, but they looked down and, and suddenly it's healed up. And, and, and they checked themselves and as they went they were healed and nine of them run home. They run home to that family they haven't touched, that family they haven't been able to hold. And when mama sees her boy coming home, I could see her taking her apron off, running out of the kitchen, running out into the yard and putting her arms around him. You're healed. And all the family's crying. They're healed. And they're having just the biggest celebration. And one out of the ten did not do that. One out of the ten turned around and before he went home and had a celebration, he went back to Jesus and he fell at his feet and he began to worship him, thanking him. And something happened to him that did not happen to them. Nine of them got healed of their leprosy, but they did not get made whole. Only one of them who returned and began to be worshipers, a worshiper of Jesus, had his self restored completely. I want you to understand that the word whole means complete, no lacking parts, altogether, unbroken, undivided, undamaged. In other words, nine of them. Even to this day, med medical science, can they do have medicine that can stop leprosy from spreading, that can, that can stop you from getting leprosy, but if you've had leprosy and it's taken from you, fingers and, and ears and nose and all kinds of things, if it's taken from you, that medicine can't give it back to you. These men went home but make no mistake about it, they still look like what they had been through. They still, if their fingers were missing, they had, at least it wasn't spreading. At least they weren't going to lose their arm up to their elbow. It stopped and whatever condition they were in, the leprosy was healed. But they still had the effects of what that disease had done to them all over them. They still had the pain of what they looked like, what they had been through. But when Jesus got through of the one, with the one who came back and worshipped him, he said to him what he did not say to the other nine, be made whole. And in that moment, can you see him? As he's worshiping Jesus, his nose comes back. His fingers come back. His feet come back. His life is made whole and restored. This is what worship can do for you. This is what learning to be a worshiper can do in your life. You know, a lot of us, I think a lot of people come to our churches and they look at us and they think, look at that band up there. They don't know anything about addiction. 
They don't know anything about not having a father in their life. Look at these people. They're sharp. They look dressed. They look nice. They're intelligent. They don't know anything about divorce. They don't know anything about a child abuse. They don't know anything about being abused when I was a kid. They don't know any. No, it's not that we don't know. It's just we started worshiping Jesus and we don't look like what we've been through. It's, it's not that we can't relate. The truth is, the reason we sing the songs and preach the gospel is because we know only Jesus can fix some things in your life. You know, uh, just because we don't look like what we've been through doesn't mean we didn't go through it. When you see us up here preaching and when you see us up here singing and when you see us up here ministering, it, it, it sometimes can look like we've got the greatest and the most blessed life. The truth is behind every person whom God is using, they have been through something so ugly, but God has restored their life and they don't look like what they've been through. Only the gospel can do that. You know, if you smoke five packs of cigarettes a day, it's a matter of time before you start looking like it. If you've got a bunch of dopey friends and, and you get your roach clip out and y'all start passing the weed around every day, every day, every day, it's a matter of time before you start looking like a roach clip. It's just going to happen. If, you, if you're dating hoochie mamas and, and, and trap queen, it's just a matter of time. If that's who you're hanging out with, you start wearing crazy clothes, you start letting it all hang out. It's just a matter. You start looking like what you went through. But Jesus can take people who have been through bankruptcy and addiction and bondage and sorrow and divorce and brokenness and heartache and lonely nights. He can take them and so heal them that you would look at them. And I'm sure when that one leper came home, his mom and daddy said, is it you? You don't look like you were a leper. Is it really you? And do you know there's people when God gets through with you are going to say, is that really you? I remember who you were and I see who you are. Take a praise break and give him praise. <laughs> Hallelujah. Come on, balcony, give him a shout of praise. If you know you don't look like what you've been through. Turn to somebody and say, is that really you? I knew you when. I thought I, I, Nebuchadnezzar said, heat up the furnace seven times hotter and throw Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego into the fiery furnace. Threw them into the furnace. And then he looked in. I can see him clearing off the window, the smudge, looking in. Let me see how they're burning. And when he looked in, the Bible said he saw four loose. <laughs> I love that, loose. They threw them in bound. But all the fire did was set them free. And, and, and when they looked and he saw four men loose, he said, didn't we throw three in? Who is the fourth man? He, has, he looks like the Son of God. Three plus fire equals four. <laughs> if you want to get to Jesus, go through the fire. There's something about people who go through the fire that they get to Jesus. Sometimes the only way to get to Jesus and get a fresh anointing, I know you want somebody to hit you in the head and fall out and get them. I know you want their oil. I know you want to call for their holy water. Hopefully you're not that weird. But there's some people, listen to me. There's no shortcuts to Jesus. Sometimes he will let you walk through the fire. But I love what the rest of that verse said in Daniel 6. It said... And when they brought them out of the fiery furnace, there was not one hair on their head singed and not the smell of smoke in their garments. Just, 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 just look over at your neighbor and take a whiff. Say, you don't smell as smoky as you used to. You, you, you used to smell. I used to get all kinds of scents from you. But Jesus must be healing you because you don't look like the trial you walked through. 
When you worship God, he makes you complete. But praise God that he can restore the broken. See, when we walk through a fiery furnace, go through a severe trial in our home or marriage or family, the devil wants you to look like and smell like that trial the rest of your life. Sorrow, went through a divorce, shame, guilt, pain, heartbreak, untrust, can't trust nobody, sorry old man cheated on you, and, that, and you're going to sing somebody done somebody wrong song the rest of your life. But when you start coming to a church like this, they start worshiping and he teaches the word and you start worshiping Jesus. You know what he'll do? He'll restore your trust. He'll restore your faith. He'll restore your soul. He restores my soul. There's times when I've preached and I felt like I had preached my soul out and I wasn't even in touch with my emotions anymore. What do I do? I run back, preacher. I run back to Jesus and worship him. Give him leper worship. Nothing good may be happening that I've asked you to do, but I worship you for who you are. You know, you know God, God doesn't want you to look like what you've been through. That's why the prodigal son in Luke chapter 15, when he hopped over the pig pen fence and said, I've had enough of this slop. I'm going home. And he had the filth all over him. And your Bible said, it's one of the most amazing stories, the father saw him from afar and ran out to meet him. Why did the father run? He was saying, I don't want this whole village to see what my boy's been through. So let me put the robe of righteousness and cover him. Let me put, look, the ring, I'm restoring his gift. Sometimes you can mess up and the enemy will say, God will never use you again. But the father says, I'm restoring your gift. The gifts and the calling of God are without repentance. And just because you messed up doesn't mean God has written you off. If you will let Him, He'll put a robe of righteousness on you and cover what you've been through. He'll put shoes on your feet, put His American Express Platinum on your finger. And when He came back home, He looked like a businessman. Can you see him? He didn't look like he'd been in the pig pen. He didn't look like he had lost him. He looked like a businessman. Where you been? On a trip. <laughs> and that's your story. You don't look like what you've been through. His name was Legion, Mark chapter 5. Because he was possessed with many devils. A legion, according to military terms, a legion was 6,000 soldiers. This man in Mark chapter 6 had 6,000 demons living inside of him. He would rip his clothes off in the tombs and take stones and cut himself. He was scarred all over his body from cutting himself. I hate you. I hate you. I hate you. But Jesus, the, the most amazing part of that story to me is when Jesus came ashore in the area of the Gadarenes, the Bible said that this man who had 6,000 demons came and fell at Jesus' feet and worshipped him. Wait a minute. 6,000 demons couldn't stop this man from worshipping Jesus. What's your problem? Who hurt your feelings? You didn't get to sing the solo and now you don't want to sing on the praise team anymore. What is your problem? 6,000 demons. You didn't get the right parking spot or somebody didn't shake. What is your problem? 6,000 demons couldn't. Nothing is authorized to stop your praise. Cancer isn't. Disease isn't. Lack isn't. Nothing is authorized to stop your praise. If you can't do anything else, if you give him leper worship, you'll attract the presence of God to your need. I'm almost done, but take your seat. I'm going to call for him in a minute, but not yet. Now watch this. Deity and demons can't live in the same place. And as he worshiped, Jesus said, be made whole. Demons leave. 
addiction leave. Prescription drugs leave. Painkillers leave. Secrets on the internet leave. Get out. He's a worshiper. And nothing is authorized to stop his prayer. And then I love what it said. It said, and when the village came, he was sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed. In other words, Jesus had covered the scars because he didn't want him to look like what he had been through. He was clothed and in his right mind. Because it's not that, number one, God uses people who have scars, who have scars. But He doesn't want you to look like the abuse, the rape, the hurt, the bankruptcy, the disappointment, the the dysfunctional family. He doesn't want you to look like that the rest of your life. I, I want to take you to Solomon's temple for my last point. We often give credit to Solomon for building the temple. I look at this place, wow. But as great and grand as this place is, it's, it's pitiful compared to Solomon's temple. And everybody says that it's Solomon's temple. The truth is Solomon did not build the temple. Wisdom is not you doing everything. Wisdom is when you find somebody who can do it better than you and you get them to do it and then you put your name on it. <laughs> Because that's what Solomon did. He, he hired a guy named Hiram, and he was a masterful builder. See, we preachers need to learn that. We aren't supposed to be everything and do everything. Sometimes wisdom says, I'm going to find somebody who knows how to do it better than I do and let them do it. At some point, it's not about you, hot shot. We're really called to raise other people up. But let me finish. Watch this. God said to David, Solomon, your son, is young and tender. He can't build me the temple that I want, so I want you to go get all the material. I want you to fight a bunch of wars because you're a bloody man. Every day, every day David came home from the office, he had blood splattered all over him. He killed somebody. He was a killer. God said, God said himself, he's too bloody. He's a bloody man. He was a renaissance man. I love the contrast, the contrast of David. One minute, one minute, David is a warrior. The next minute, he played the harp. (laughs) Nothing against harp players, but but when I think of a harp, when I think of a warrior, I think of a camouflage suit. I see tattoos. I see David with a bandana tied around his head. He looks like Rambo. He's a killer. But then he's a heart player. <laughs> and he wrote poetry. He's a killer. He killed, he, he, he cut the foreskins off of 300 men. This guy's, this guy's brutal. You, you figure out what that means. But I'm just saying, it's, it's, this guy is, he, he's, he's, he's out there. But then, but then, then he would sit, David was bad, y'all, because, because he would cut you into pieces. Read, read Psalms. Smash, break their teeth, oh Lord. He says that. That's one, that's a Bible verse. Oh Lord, break, break the teeth of my enemies. Smite them, oh God. Crush them as dirt in the earth. I praise thee. He's the kind of guy that would chop you up and then write a poem and put it, make it a harp song and sing about it. Kind of like your pastor. Renaissance man. Solomon is young and tender. Solomon didn't know how to build nothing. He was smart, but he didn't know how to build nothing. He hadn't been out and seen all the world. He didn't know how to build no temple. If, if it had been left up to Solomon, he would have he he put bean bags in there. He's young. He's tender. He's a, he's a kid wearing skinny jeans. He would have put, he'd have put bean, bean bags and velvet Elvis pictures up on the wall and unicorns. And... 
He didn't know how to build nothing. But your Bible said that God told David, go gather all the gold over a million talents. Go ga gather all the silver of a million point two talents of silver. Go gather all the precious stones that will be needed in the breastplate of the high priest. Go gather everything, the curtains, the cedars, everything that will be used, the marble, everything in that temple. You lay it at the foot of Mount Moriah and when you leave this world, you make sure everything's there. Then make sure he's got Hiram to build it and then put Solomon's temple on him. Watch. When that temple was finished, if you'd have walked through with Solomon and said, give me a guided tour, Solomon would say, look at that gold. Wow. Look at that silver. Oh, it looks so holy. Look at that. Look at that Ark of the Covenant. Oh, look at the gold on it. Look at that breastplate on the high priest, those 12 stones representing the 12 tribes of Israel. Oh, you would have said, oh. But if you could have got a guided tour by David, he would have had a different story. He would have said, see that gold? You know where I got that from? I got it from the house of a prostitute when I attacked the Hittites. and I brought it back to the temple and sprinkled blood on it and dedicated it to God. And we melted it down. And now it's part of the Ark of the Covenant, the mercy seat. And, oh, you... You, 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 see, you, see, you see those stones on the, on, the, on the breastplate of the high priest. You know where that red ruby came from? I pried it out of the God of the Amorites. They worshipped a statue and they had it in his eyes. And I pried it out and brought it back and sprinkled blood on it and dedicated it to God. And now it doesn't look like what it's been through. And you and I were lost. We were in the world we were so messed up cutting off a piece of our life every day and watching our emotions die, our souls die. But the son of David named Jesus, a bloody man, said I could use him. I could use her. I could use that one right there. So I think I'll pry them out of the world. I think I'll bring them back to my temple and set them in the house, put them on the let him play the guitar let him play the keyboards let me set him on this thing let me put those ear things in his ears let me let me find this one I found him way out there this guy was way out there but I pried him out of the God of some demon that had him and now he's planted in the house of God and he doesn't look like what he's been through because he's a worshiper and he's been made whole Get up on your feet and give God praise if you believe. He can make you whole. He can make you whole. He can make you worship. It's not something we do. Worship is not a time filler until the little sermon comes. If you don't get this aspect, you will never be made whole. This is how you get back your losses. You turn back to Jesus after He saves you and stops and cuts off the power of sin. He did that on the cross. You don't have to do anything. You don't get good to get God. You get God to get good. All He requires of you is to turn back and do more than stand during praise and worship. Do more than go through the routine. But if you will begin out of your pain, to give God out of your questions, out of your fiery trials, out of your disappointments, if you will give God leper worship, I don't praise you for what you've done. I praise you for who you are. You have saved me. You have redeemed me. You have chosen me. God chose you. That should humble you. That should turn you into a worshiper. And I don't care. Listen, I really feel like, I really feel this tonight. Or Joel said, and I will restore the years. The canker worm, the locusts have eaten up. 
and you shall never be ashamed. And I will pour out my spirit on your flesh. The part of you that was messed up. I'll pour my spirit on it. And you won't look like what you've been through. Worship will make you complete. Undivided. It will heal you and make you whole. Are you ready for that? This is your night.